Hi, and welcome to Ruth Reads. My name is Ruth Vander Zee, and I, today I'm going to be reading one of my stories. To understand my stories, you have to understand that throughout history, a lot of people made a lot of decisions. And some of them were good, and some of them were not good. But all those decisions affected children in some way or another. And the reason I like my stories so much is that my stories happened to real life people. And along the way, they told me their stories. They trusted me to tell me a lot about their story. And they told me that I could tell you. So what amazes me is that they went through so many difficult experiences but they all came out the other end with hope and strength and courage. Along the way, they asked a lot of hard questions. They wondered why things happened to them, and they had to figure a lot out. But one thing for sure is when they told me their stories, they touched my heart, and I was inspired, and I hope their stories inspire you. Mississippi Morning, written by Ruth Vanderzee, illustrated by Floyd Cooper, and published by Erdman's Books for Young Readers. This story takes place in the 1930s, and if you've studied that period of time, you know that our, the United States, and probably a lot of the world, was going through a great financial crisis. And people were out of work and were struggling all over the United States. In addition to struggling for money, in the South particularly, um, people who were black were suffering a great deal just because there was so much prejudice against them. And Mississippi Morning tells the story a little bit of what life was like then. In order to tell this story, and to tell you the truth and not tell you anything that wasn't true or that couldn't have happened, I went to Mississippi and talked to anybody who would listen to me. And one person I met is actually Saul Heyman, who is a very famous artist. But he lives in this little house in Mississippi. And when I spoke with him, he told me so many background in, uh, facts that I wouldn't have known if I hadn't spoken with him. But he also showed me one of the paintings that he painted. Uh, and of all things, the one painting he showed me was a picture of the town that I was imagining in my head after doing some research. This is the exactly the way I thought the town would look in my mind. And here Saul Heyman had painted a picture of this town at the very time that I was writing the story. And I was so happy. But I have to tell you one little story about Saul Heyman. When he was a little boy, he was only given a couple of pieces of paper a year to go to school with, to write on. And he had one pencil. And he said, my mama was so unhappy with me because every time I was given a new piece of paper, I drew all over it. And he said, when those papers were full, I'd find anything I could to draw on. I just had to draw. Well, this is Saul Heyman's picture of the town that I was imagining. And then... Floyd Cooper, who is the illustrator of this book, painted this picture of the town. And when you look at both of them together, you can see that they've both painted practically the same town. There's just little differences, but each one has painted that town pretty much the way I was hoping they would. 
And that's what's so wonderful about illustrators and books is that they imagine and they do such a good job of imagining and of researching. This is the title or the dedication page in the book. And now let's read the story. James William, I don't know how we could keep this place going without your help. You can go now, but you be sure you don't get into any trouble. I wiped the sweat from my sunburned face and looked at Ma. She seemed to worry about trouble. I had no idea why. It was 1933 and life was good for me. Ma kept busy caring for my two younger sisters, her garden, and the few animals we still had. I did a lot of the chores early in the morning and then was free to roam in the woods near our place. The last thing I would ever want to do is put my ma's mind to worrying about anything. Pa had rented out our land long ago and was busy in the hardware store he owned in town. Some afternoons I'd walk into town and help him. Yep, this is my son, he'd brag to anyone within earshot. He does all the chores at home so I can run this store. I'd sweep the wooden floor and listen to my pa. It seemed that somebody was always stopping in at one time or other to talk to him. In fact, one afternoon, one of those men walked over to where I was working and said, You know, James William, most of the important decisions in our part of Mississippi are made right here on the porch of your papa's store. I was proud when he said that. It seemed all the men in town respected my pa. They'd huddled together. They wondered about the weather. They worried how cotton prices were dropping. They remembered how good things used to be. Every now and then they'd talk so low I couldn't hear what they were saying. They'd talk in troubled tones and wave their fingers at each other. One day I asked my pa, why do they get so riled when they talk with each other? Son, there are some things you just don't understand, Pa said sternly. Times are hard right now. These are good men. They're trying their hardest to put food on the table for their families. But no matter how hard they work, they still don't have two nickels to rub together. He looked me straight in the eye. James William. These men are trying to protect what little they have. A man's got to do what he thinks is best for his family. Thick woods surrounded our property. I roamed these woods with Red, who lived close by. Red's real name was Charles, but he'd been called Red ever since his hair came in a fiery orange. I had been lucky enough to get a rifle for my 12th birthday, so we'd hunt raccoons and rabbits. As we hunted, we'd swap stories. Sometimes we'd get to exaggerate so much the truth of our stories was hard to find. But Red got my attention real fast when he started talking about what he heard his pa talking to my pa about down at the store. Yep, he drawled. I heard your pa telling my pa that colored preacher who lives on the way out of town got what was coming to him. What do you mean got what was coming to him? I asked. His house burned by accident. It wasn't nobody's fault. Not according to what I heard, Red replied. Your pa said that man had to be stopped from stirring up colored folk said he was telling them to register to vote. Then my pa said men like him were nothing but trouble, and it was high time they learned their lesson. Are you telling me that somebody went and burned that house, I asked. Nobody would do that. Well, go ask your pa. I couldn't hear everything because they were talking real quiet, but I'm sure I heard it right. I'm sure you heard it wrong, I answered. Besides spending many long hours with Red that summer, I also spent time with Leroy, whose family sharecropped 
on the land next to ours. Leroy was the best fisherman around. On afternoons when I wanted to fish, I'd find Leroy. He knew more about hooks and bait and good fishing spots than anybody I knew. We always fished in secluded places where no one would notice us. My pa always spoke disparagingly about white folk spending time with colored folk. He said it wasn't natural. One afternoon when the fish weren't biting, I said, Hey, Leroy, let's go fish under that tree over there. That looks like a good spot. Leroy didn't look at me. He didn't say anything for a long time. I thought maybe he hadn't heard me. Finally, he spoke so as I almost missed it. I don't want to fish there. Why? Because that's the hanging tree. What in the world are you talking about, I asked. That's where the clan left a black man hanging for a whole day because he did something they didn't like. The clan? Yeah, those people who ride at night wearing their white robes and ugly pointed hoods. They're scary. I never heard of no clan, I said. You may not have heard of the clan, but my mama told me just the other night that they poured hot tar over a black man who talked to a white lady. They don't mess around. They took bull whips to my friend's daddy. Are you sure? I asked. Yeah, I'm sure. My daddy says that we black folk just have to be careful and mind our own business. That's why I don't tell him that I come fishing with you. He wouldn't like it. I thought about what Leroy said for a long time. Somehow it didn't make sense to me. Whenever I went into town, I saw colored men trading at my pa's store. They were polite and called my pa, sir. My pa was always friendly and said, Now, boy, you come back when you need something else. Colored men and women traded in the five and dime all the time. They kept money in the bank, and on some Saturdays, they were allowed to sit in the balcony of the theater to watch a movie. This all seemed normal to me. It's true they couldn't drink out of the same water fountain as white folk or eat in the same coffee shop. They had to wait to be served in the stores until white folk had been served. But that's just the way things were. I don't think any of those white folk hated anybody enough to hang them from a tree. I couldn't imagine any one of my pa's friends wearing a pointed hood or a white robe and burning somebody's house. A few days after talking to Leroy, I was sweeping the floor of the store. My pa and I were alone. I had been thinking about what Red and Leroy had told me. I was trying to figure it out. Pa, I asked, do you know anything about people who wear pointed hoods with white robes and hurt colored people? Pa looked at me. Where did you hear that? Red told me. Seems to me Red should be minding his own business. Now you get back to sweeping the floor, Pa said in a tone that meant the discussion was over. One morning in early August, I awoke before dawn. As long as I was awake, I thought I might as well get up and milk our old tired Jersey cow. I scuffed my way to the barn. Rivers of sweat were running down my back. I was walking back to the house with a pail full of milk. The rising sun filtered through the muggy air. In the morning haze, I wondered if I was seeing things. A white-robed person was running down the road at the edge of our land. The face was covered with a white hood. I hid behind the maple that had shaded our house for years and watched the hood, hooded creature run. All of Leroy's stories flashed through my mind. My heart drummed in my chest. As I was trying to figure out how to get to the kitchen to protect my ma and the babies, I saw the white-robed person turn in towards my house. I froze. I looked into the ghastly cut-out eye holes 
on the hood of the creature. As he ran towards the house, the man stumbled and the hood lifted up. His face was uncovered. My pa's face. My pa was hiding under that hood. My pa. As he reached up to pull the hood back down over his face, my father saw me. He never spoke to me about that morning. I never asked. I couldn't find the words. After that, I still went to the store. I didn't want to, but I did it. I hung around with Red and fished occasionally with Leroy, but somehow everything was different. I still loved my pa, but I never really looked into his eyes again, and he never really looked into mine. The end. Thank you. Thanks for visiting Ruth Reads. All my books are based on critical social issues and are great for curriculum use. If you have any questions that arose as I was reading the book, or if you have any curriculum guide needs, please visit my website at www.ruthvanderzee.com. You can find all my information there and you can contact me. It will also be linked in the description box below. Please like and subscribe to this video. That would be so nice if you do that. You can purchase my books at any independent local bookstore or at Amazon.com. And I have to give a shout out to my awesome producer, Ilse Vanderzee. Thanks for visiting. See you soon.